behalf of LL, please welcome all of you. Um, from all sides of the Fletcher community who are here for this. This is our first uh, high table for the spring semester. And uh, we've got with us today, Mr. Tony Anene Maido, who is the founding registrar of the Court of Justice of the Economic Community of West African States, um, and um, worked in that capacity from 2004 when the court opened its doors until late last year. Um, so basically, he's got the the institutional memory. He is the institutional memory of the ECOWAS court. And in testament to that, they've not let him go. So he's still at the uh, he's still uh, doing some work at the court. Um, and um, it's also the case that he is a proud Fletcher parent. Um, he wasn't able to uh, be a Fletcher while his child was here. And um, we felt it would make sense to get him here because of COVID, he could not come to Fletcher. And we felt it made sense to get him here to have his revenge. Um, <laughs> so this is Tony's revenge on COVID, not on Fletcher, but <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and Tony, welcome to Fletcher. And so I, I think you're already introduced to uh, the community, Nathalia. Now, the structure is we'll start off with initial set of remarks for about 20 minutes, we we'll then open it up for about 25, 30 minutes, thereabouts, and then we'll come back to round up. Yeah, please. Well, thank you very much, Jiddy. It's my privilege to be here, and I'm very happy to be here indeed. And I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. It's always a pleasure to talk about the ECOWAS Court of Justice or the human rights mechanism of ECOWAS. The time is just too short for us to talk about it. But I've written a paper which I believe has been circulated to all of you. I will just uh, give uh, the key highlights of that paper. And we should start from the very beginning about ECOWAS. ECOWAS was established in 1975 as a regional economic community for West African states. At the beginning, it comprised of 16 countries in the West African sub-region, 16. But in 2000, one of them withdrew, Mauritania. So we have currently 15 member states of ECOWAS. The main objective of ECOWAS, you know, is to integrate the economies, the economies of the member states. And the, the idea is to foster cooperation and integration leading to the establishment of an economic union in the community. And to achieve that, they are supposed to go through various stages having a customs union, a common market, and eventually an economic community. ECOWAS is still on that road. And it's important to note that of the eight regional economic communities in Africa that serve as the building blocks for the African economic community, ECOWAS is indeed the leading REC, you know, in terms of institutional framework, and the agenda for integration. The course has done very well. At the very beginning, when it was set up in 1975, there was no intention. There was no intention under the 1975 treaty to delve into human rights. We must establish, make that very clear. No intention from the very beginning to delve into human rights. A founding protocol that set out the status powers, composition, you know, and, and practice and procedure of the court was adopted in 1991. Was adopted in 1991. Unfortunately, the court did not come into existence until the year 2001, when the pioneer judges, seven pioneer judges were sworn in in Bamako, Mali on 30 January 2001. So the court basically is 
22 years old now, still a very young institution. The 19, the, in 1993, the committee adopted a new revised, a new, a revised treaty that replaced the founding 1975 treaty. And in this revised treaty, Equal Court of Justice was established under Article 15 of that treaty. And it was listed, it was listed in Article 6 of the revised treaty as one of the key institutions of the community. And you will see that the founding protocol made it clear that the ECOWAS Court of Justice is the principal legal organ of the community. And the intention of establishing the court was very simple, to interpret and apply the treaty and their next protocols and conventions. So basically, it was that of treaty supervision and oversight functions. That was the, the, the essence of setting up in order to facilitate the integration process. And that was the intention. Nobody, so as I said, under that 1975 treaty, the initial 1975 treaty and the 1991 protocol on the court, no human, con, human rights content whatsoever. But things changed, changed dramatically in 1989 when there was a civil war in Liberia which lasted from 89 to 2003 and uh, spread to Sierra Leone. And uh, it involved very serious and egregious human rights violations. So the community leaders had a rethink that there was no way they would be able to, you know, achieve the community objectives if there's no peace, if there's no security, if there's no political stability, and if there's no respect for human rights. So it was a real awakening. And that led the, the community leaders, you know, to take a very important step. And that was in 1991 the, when they adopted the ECOWAS Declaration of Political Principles. And in this, you know, in this declaration, they realized the importance of rule of law, democracy and good, uh, good, good governance, and more importantly, respect for human rights. And they agreed in principle in that declaration that they will respect, you know, fundamental, you know, not, you know human rights and fundamental freedoms, you know, in, in all its plenitude in all the member states. So it was a very important declaration, you know, and that was followed, you know, uh, that was followed in 1993 when they adopted the revised treaty. And in the revised treaty of 1993, they had, uh, fundamental principles that they agreed to in the community. And in Article 4G of that, uh, of that treaty, they agreed to adhere to the recognition, promotion and protection of human rights, human rights, human and people's rights in accordance with the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. So it was a very important step, 1993. But they still went a step further, you know, in 19... Uh, 89, you know, in 1999, when they adopted the mechanism for conflict, you know, prevention, management, resolution, peacekeeping, and security, what we generally refer to as the mechanism. And in this, they recognized you need, you know, to respect and protect human rights in the member states. In 2001, they took a further step when they adopted the Protocol on Democracy and Good Governance. And in this protocol on democracy and good governance, far reaching human rights provisions were contained in it, apart from recognizing, you know, they had a, what you refer to as general the constitutional convergence principles, in which they spelled out the basic, the cardinal principles of democracy are contained there. But let us dwell on the human rights content of the provision. Article 1H, they agreed. They agreed in Article 1H that the human rights set put in the African Charter, the human rights set put or contain the African Charter, and human rights contained in all international human rights instruments, instruments shall be guaranteed in each of the member states, in each of the member states. And in Article 39 of that uh, Protocol on Democracy, they went, you know, they made it clear that we are going to review the 
mandate, the human rights uh, mandate of the ECOWAS Court of Justice to grant it a human rights competence after the exhaustion of local remedies. You know, it was very aspirational that this was what we are going to do. And uh, this was in 2001. And in finally, in 2005, in 2005, they made good, you know, what they had say, uh, said in Article 39, when they gave, they amended the, that supplement, they adopted a supplementary protocol, which amend, amended the 1991 protocol on the Equal Court of Justice. The key elements of that supplementary protocol were one, it expanded the mandate of the Equal Court of Justice from the basic two mandates it had at the beginning, mandate as a community court, you know, um, and uh, an administrative tribunal for the equals public servants to four clear mandates by adding two additional mandates. One was uh, they give you power to act, you know, let me call it an arbitration mandate. And most importantly, they gave the court a human rights mandate. A human rights mandate. And you know, Article 9.4, Article 9.4, of the protocol, 1991 protocol as amended by the supplementary protocol now, they said that the court has jurisdiction to determine cases of violation of human rights that occur in any member state. So that was finally in 2005, they gave the court a human rights mandate. And this human rights mandate is a, a supranational mandate, you know, to adjudicate on human rights violations that occur in any ECOWAS, ECOWAS member state. As far reaching as this provision is, there were over obvious constraints, obvious constraints. Number one is that ECOWAS does not have a bill of rights, no, no, human, uh, no human rights instrument. ECOWAS does not have a bill of rights of its own. And the protocol did not prescribe <clears throat> the applicable human rights Catalog of rights, they didn't prescribe it at all. Two, it did not prescribe the nature and scope of the human rights mandate that has been, you know, that has been granted to the court. Equally, did not say the perpetrators or against whom necessary application for human rights violations can be brought again. So it was a mandate that was very fluid and very indeterminate. And uh, the court was now led to its own devices you know, you know, its own devices through its jurisprudence, you know, to define the nature and scope of its human rights mandates. And uh, the court has done very well in that regard. In the 22 years of its existence, the court has rendered 500 decisions, 500. And uh, out of these 133 rulings, 342 judgments, and there are 25 decisions on revision. If you add it up, it gives you 500. So they've done so well. Not only have they done that, the court has received international recognition for, for its human rights work. And you will note that in Africa, the Equals Court of Justice is the only court, a human, I mean, regional court, that has an explicit, explicit human rights mandate. Because as I said, it is stated in, the black, in black and white that it has jurisdiction so, you know, if you look at maybe two other vibrant courts in Africa, maybe the East African Court of Justice and SADC Tribunal, you know, apart from the Continental Court, they don't have this explicit mandate. So they have acquired those, maybe what are called through judicial activism. You look at East African Court in the case of Katabazi, and uh, you understand that was had. The Equals Court of Justice was criticized initially because it declined the opportunity it had in 2004 in the very first case that was brought before it, you know, you know, you know, in that particular Apolabi, you know, in Apolabi's case, you know, to assume a human rights man in jurisdiction. But the court declined in 2003 to say that, look, we are an interstate court. Individuals don't have access to this court and uh, haven't come without access, they rule the case inadmissible. And that followed subsequently in 2004 in Franco Court's case when that equality came, they declined until jurisdiction was given to the court formally in 2005. So they are the only courts, a sub-regional court in Africa with a, a manifest, you know, an explicit human rights mandate. 
how has the court been able to fashion this fluid and indeterminate human rights mandate? At the very beginning, 2006, 2007, it recognized in its judgment in Jeru Gokwe and Federal Republic of Nigeria that we would not have in West Africa a catalog of rights, that the, that the human that the, that the rights the court is giving power to implement have not been cataloged. And as such, that was a very hurdle it crossed. And how did they resolve that? The court simply said that since the the revised treaty of 1993 in Article 4G, the member states have already agreed that we are going to, you know, agree to the recognition, promotion, and protection of human rights, you know, in accordance with the African Charter, that they were going to apply the African Charter as having the catalog, that the catalog of rights that the community will implement since they don't have their own catalog of rights. So the African Charter has become the primary catalog that. Uh, the ECOWAS Court of Justice implements, but the, that, okay, that's the catalog the, that they implement. But if they have equally gone beyond that in so many other cases, subsequent to that, if, you know, especially in Henry Amozu and Cote d'Ivoire and Syrup and Nigeria, by saying that in addition to the African Charter, the ECOWAS Court of Justice will, you know, apply the basic United Nations human rights instruments, basically, you know, starting from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, International Covenant on Economic Social Cultural Rights. So these UN basic instruments on the ground that the ECOWAS member state, if you look at the protocol on democracy, have already agreed on their signatories to this protocol. And so long as they are signatories to these, I mean to these conventions, that they will. And that will apply them against those member states. So in other words, any human rights instrument that any of the ECOWAS member states has entered into, the ECOWAS Court of Justice will apply that instrument against that member state. But because in the protocol on democracy and good governance, they all agreed to this instrument that they mentioned, the basic, basic UN human, human rights instrument, that they will apply it against them. So that was how they resolved that issue of not having their own catalog of, catalog of rights. They've gone beyond that to you know, show that uh, the jurisdiction they have, the jurisdiction they have of, uh, of human rights, that there are, you know, that by setting you know, guiding principles, they didn't come out to say, okay, this is our guiding principle, but from the, the jurisprudence over time, you can sift the principles on which they rely on. All of them are contained in the paper in arriving at, you know, in implementing of this human rights, human rights jurisdiction as far as that. But apart from, uh, a very important, very aspect of the human rights mandate of the ECOWAS Court of Justice, which makes it very unique, is that there's no requirement for exhaustion of local remedies. No requirement for exhaustion of local remedies. Article 10D, Article 10D, you know, spells out the access to the court for human rights violation. And clearly it says that an individual can apply to the court for relief of uh, you know, for human rights violation, you know, on the condition that the application, that the application is not anonymous. And secondly, that it's not pending before another international court. So there are the only two conditions. So if you look at that, you compare it with the seven cumulative conditions under the African Charter, it is so liberal, so liberal. They demand only two conditions. And if you see under the guardian principles, once you raise an allegation of human rights jurisdiction violation, the court automatically assumes jurisdiction without even looking at the veracity of it at that point, whatever. Once you mention that my rights have been violated, it assumes jurisdiction. So the ECOWAS Court of Justice has very liberal access rules, very liberal access rules, in the sense that um, victims of human rights violation have a clear choice to make, either to go before their national courts or to come directly to the ECOWAS Court of Justice. You know that uh, the, the principle of exhaustion of um, local remedy is very well established in customer international law, but the ECOWAS Court of Justice, you know, as I said, from the very beginning, from the be made it clear and gave reasons why, you know, you are not adopting that 
in the Equus Human Rights System. You know, the very first case, a bridge, you know, look at Chief Ebriman, Mane Mane against the Gambia, you know, Moses SN against the Gambia. And all. Those cases, they made it clear because they said there are only two administrative requirements on Article 10 D, just two conditions. That Article 10 D does not contain any provision in relation to exhaustion of local remedies. And as such, they were going to apply just those two conditions, you know, just those two conditions. And, you know, and you know, after that, when the case of uh, Adija Tumani Koro against the against Nigeria Republic, which is generally referred to as the slave case, you know, in that particular case, the council, you know, to the states of Niger realized that the court has already made its position known that uh, there will be no exhaustion of local remedies. But they, they invited the court to see that as a, you know, as a lacuna in the text of the court that the court should fill in. And the Ecowas Court of Justice declined that. And finally, in two other decisions subsequent to that, one was uh, Musa Sedikan against the Gambia. In this case, the lawyers adopted a new tact. And what did they say? That Article 39 of the Protocol on Democracy and Good Governance had said clearly that they are going to review the mandates of the Ecowas Court of Justice to grant human rights during, after the exhaustion of local remedies. But you can see that there is a gap between that provision, which said after exhaustion of local remedies, and Article 9.4 of the of the protocol on the um, court as revised, which did not make mention of it. So, but the court ruled that um, the, the that equals lawmakers, equals lawmakers, has you know they have dispensed with the requirement for exhaustion of local local remedies, and they are not going to impose a more onerous condition. On the applicant, more than what are, what the equals lawmakers are provided for in this revised, I mean the supplementary, the supplementary protocol, and that the rule on exhaustion of local remedies is not inflexible; that it can be waived or legislated away. And in the case of ECOWAS, that rule has been legislated, you know, has been legislated away. And they went further to say that uh, the Article Thirty Nine, you know. You know, it's a, it's a general provision, but that the one on the court is specific to the court and specific provisions should override general principles. But finally, the court had an opportunity to revisit this issue again in the case of Ocean King against uh, Senegal. And in that case, they adopted the same argument of Article 39. So the court was now compelled to, you know, after you know, upholding his decision in uh, Musa said he can, they now went a step further, you know, to overrule, you know, the, you, know you know, declare null and void part of that Article 39 that was inconsistent because under the supplementary provision, uh, I mean, supplementary protocol Article 10 said clearly that any other provision, the prior provision that's inconsistent with the provision of, uh, of that supplementary rule is null and void. And the court now used that provision to declare Article 39 as null and void. So at the, after this decision, Ocean King, it has now become firmly established in the jurisprudence of the court that there's no requirement of, uh, for exhaustions of, exhaustion of local remedy. It has obvious benefits, which I, I don't really have time to delve, to delve into now, but let's look at briefly the scope, the scope of the human rights, uh, the human rights, the court has ruled, yeah. Only that the yeah, okay that the protection of human error, it, protection of human rights is a cardinal and fundamental value of the community, you know, and that this human rights mandate is expansive, expansive. If you look at uh, Linda, Linda Gomez and the Gambia, it made it clear that this human rights mandate is expansive, and because of that, the court, um, you know, because of that, social political, I mean, civil and political rights, social economic, you know. Right, cultural, everything that has jurisdiction to en entertain uh, these uh, applications. So the scope is very wide, and uh, the jurisprudence of the of 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 the court has dealt very copiously on various aspects of uh, what is of the, of the access rules, the access rules to the to the Equal Court of Justice. In as much as the court has equally said that. Is expansive. It has also put in place measures to delimit 
the scope that are put in place. And one of the critical ones is the fact that the court has said that it is an international court um, for any human, any application, um, any human rights application that is brought before it must have international character. So we can imply that this uh, has become like a third condition, you know, apart from the rule, the one of non-pendency and non-anonymity that the, every dispute brought before it must have in international character. Mm -hmm. So that is in this jurisprudence. It has equally said that it's not an appellate court over the national courts of member states. You know, it applies the treaty, the treaty of ECOWAS and its international human rights instrument that have been adopted. It's not in the business of applying the, the national constitutions of members or anything. It goes by treaty. Since it's a court established by treaty and it's just there to apply those treaties and not the constitutions or domestic laws of, of member states. So it has uh, given us decisions in order, I mean, the, the limit is, is mandate in other area, but we don't have time to go into all of that. Maybe during discussion, we'll be able to dwell on some of these things. But most importantly, you know, the court is an independent court, very, very independent, and it guards its independence very jealously very jealously, it has won international awards. I remember when the slave case was given in 2007, the victim, the, you will know, was received in White House by the first lady of America at that time. And last year, it won the, the Columbia University Global Prize on the on freedom of expression. You know, it has given so many important decisions in the in respect to women's rights and other, other, other rights. You know, it was the first court in Africa to apply the Maputo, Maputo, Maputo protocol, apply the CEDAW in addition to this other instrument. So thank you very much. I'll be willing to participate in the discussion to take your question later. Thank you. So that's a tester now to the main court. Uh, we'll take three, four questions in clusters and then uh, return to our speaker. Yes. So the, you've got please, man. No, no. Actually, I want to be like the third or fourth in the first. Okay. Place. So Virendra. <laughs> yes, Simon. Um. Okay, Christoph. And then. Okay. Do we take the first sequence and then come to you? Okay. Okay. Yes. So any Rahul, do you want to say something? Yes. You have a question. You got Rahul, Padmini, right? Rachel, I see you smiling. <laughs> you want you have a no, no, I'm okay for now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Jeff Korea. All right. Okay. And then we've got Paul, uh, Mr. Robinson. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. In that order, starting with Birendra. Thank you. Uh, in your speech, you mentioned several times about the jurisprudence, the evolving jurisprudence. Nico was, you said, began with 16 countries, which we know. Now, when we really see, we find one of the biggest challenges facing ECOWAS would be of terrorism and corruption. Whether we are talking of economics or the human rights, either of them will affect them. Now, if terrorism and corruption are the major challenges, that means it calls for predominance of judicial spirit. If we are looking at rule of law, which, which pulls me towards judicial activism. ECOWAS would say, what kind of, or what kind of jurisprudential evolution would ECOWAS advise or insist upon the member countries? so that terrorism and corruption can be handled. Simon? <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm from Switzerland and we have the European Court of uh, Human Rights. So I would be interested in the, uh, the court's relationship to the countries because essentially human rights infringements would be done by the member states of ECOWAS and the court may in a judgment 
tell the countries that there has been a human rights um, infringement and the countries maybe don't like this decision or their the views. So in terms of sovereignty uh, of the countries and how they deal with the human rights issues, how is the court perceived? And is it more a partnership or is it viewed more skept uh, skepticism? And does the view differ from country, uh, depending on the country? Well, Simon just stole my questions. <laughs> that was too bad, but I can just add, I think- we're Maybe you can phrase it better. No, no, it was excessive phrase, but I also think that as we also can, you know, European Union also have a certain uh, part of human rights, and you can see that member states subscribing to this and everything, but then when there's a verdict against them, the tonality, you know, the the, the stakes are rise, definitely. So, yeah, it's basically the same question. Rahul, please. Yes. You said um, the ECOWAS has delivered more than 500 decisions, and that's, I think, far more than Human Rights Committee, uh, which governs the ICCPR. So is it the failure of the HRC or that ECOWAS has fared far much better than uh, the court, which has actually has a global mandate and has over like 190 state parties? I'm just curious to know. Can we fit in Parmenia and Chep career and then you revert and then we'll take Pearl? Because I think Pearl has some very substantial things. <laughs> yes. Oh, sure. Um, so, this related to what Rahul asked, but um, actually, two questions. First is how does uh, ECOWAS's jurisdiction uh, apply to in terms of other courts of justice that are around, present around the world, like in terms of judicata mechanisms. And the second one would be, has there been any conversation or dialogue to expand the jurisdiction beyond the current member states of ECOWAS? Um, I also have two questions. One is, what, how do you define, how does the court define international character of cases? And then secondly, are there mandates uh, that have not been tapped into maybe does the court have the power to issue advisory opinions or uh, to rule potentially be able to rule on democracy and elections but those a lot of focus has gone into human rights uh, and any other mandates that maybe the treaty or the protocols have awarded do you want to take this quickly and then we'll get back to let me take the last two questions. Because I didn't have, have the opportunity to. The last build. shall be the first. I didn't have the opportunity to build on that. How the court defines international character. It's more, you know, it is simple that the, the disputes that have been brought before the court must arise out of a human rights treaty. You know, not just on the constitution of member states that guarantee the fundamental rights, but out of a human rights convention. That is very first thing that most arise. It must be such that, that not a case that can be handled at the domestic level. The first time that the court declared that principle was in the case of a private uh, Peter David and Ambassador Raffle, which uh, now the court was saying that Peter David sued. You know, a private thing in ground before the courts. The court said, this is a matter that should go normally before the national courts. Because our human rights, the, the human rights team we are dealing with, they engage the community and international responsibility of the member states. If you have a problem with your landlord or you have a problem with your wife, this is not the court for you to come to. Because here is the, inter the, the international obligations that, or the community obligations that member states have assumed under those treaties that can be brought before the court. So that is the way, and said in, in that very case, that it will follow the practice of other international human rights courts, and to not depart from that. So for you to bring a case before, it must be a case that the issue submitted, uh, as the court uh, says specifically, was arise from rights guaranteed for the benefit of human beings. You know, it must also relate to the, to the international and community obligations, you know, of the member states, what's the obligation for them to promote, protect, you understand, and respect human rights. 
you know, it must arise. And finally, that is the violation of that right that we are bringing before, before the Equals Court of Justice. And you, you mentioned the issue of policy or political decision. As I said, the court has given many decisions in relation to political rights, so many. And I give you two examples in, um, in CDP against Burkina Faso. You remember the former strongman, the Blair Compaore was the president for a very long time. And uh, a time came that there was uprising in the streets of uh, Burkina Faso and the man fled the country. He left the Abani Relinguish Power and fled. The transition government, this transition government, you know, promulgated a law that banned, that banned the political party of Le Compaoré mm -hmm. and the supporters from contesting in the upcoming uh, election. And they came before the court and they said, no, you cannot do that. You cannot promulgate a, a legislation that will deprive people of their political rights who have not committed any offense, you know, and directed the uh, Bukina Faso to repeal and amend that law. And they did, do you understand? So, you know, Khalifa, so many other cases like that. that if, even the very first case of Jeru Gokwe, you know, against Nigeria, was a political, you know, was a political case. So it was an election petition that was brought before Nigerian court from the election tribunal to the court of appeal, and he lost. And uh, after losing, he ran to the Equals Court of Justice. That is right to fair hearing had been violated, you know. And uh, there was a, an uproar in Nigerian press because for them, the Court of Appeal was the highest court in election matters. And for them to have brought that same matter to the Equals Court of Justice, but the court said that the, the, the violation to right to fair hearing has been alleged. And God, that has been alleged. It will always entertain it, even if it had been heard by the highest court in any, mem in any member states. You, somebody also asked about the relationship with him, you know, the, you know, national court, you know, the Equals Court of Justice have been treading very carefully in that direction because Article 10 did mention that the matter must not be pending before another international court, clearly. And in the case of uh, Valentin Ayika against Liberia, the Equals Court of Justice said that the Supreme Courts are not domestic Courts of member states do not qualify as international courts. That a matter has gone before, they will not preclude the court from entertaining that matter. But all the court does is that the court will not sit on it as an appeal. But if you come before the court to say that your right to fair hearing, you know, was violated before the Supreme Court of a member state, Equals Court of Justice will entertain it. You know, if you come before it with fresh issues, you are not coming on appeal, you are alleging that your human rights have been violated, the Equals Court of Justice we entertain uh, that, that case. You, somebody mentioned the, the, the number of cases, the 500 that the ECOWAS Court of Justice has delivered as compared to the HRC. I don't think the ECOWAS Court of Justice has any control over that. As I said, because another, an, another point you must note is that the ECOWAS Court of Justice does not have a filter mechanism. No filter mechanism, as you see, for probably the Inter-American Court or the African Court of Human and People's Rights. So initially, there was the fear that you open the floodgate, people just come directly without the exhaustion of local remedies, and you don't have a filter mechanism, that the court is going to be overwhelmed. Probably that is why we have so many cases before the, the court. And I'll attribute it to these two points. One, lack of a filter mechanism, and secondly, the point that there's no requirement for exhaustion of local remedies. That is to have so many cases. As I speak to you, you have one it's eight cases pending before the Equals Court of Justice. And every day, more cases uh, are being filed before the court because, as I said, very, very liberal access rules, very independent courts, has a, a supranational mandate, you know? So these are very attractive features for the court that uh, make it possible for, for people to come before the court, especially if you look at the, the back, against the backlog of the region where you have very fragile, democracies, we are in many national courts, you cannot guarantee their independence, you know, courts that can probably be influenced easily. So these are the features why so many cases are, you know, the ECOWAS community citizens have chosen to come directly to the ECOWAS Court of Justice instead of uh, resorting to domestic jurisdictions. So on, on, the, on the issue of, of sovereignty, the ECOWAS, ECOWAS 
Court of Justice recognize, recognizes the fact that the member states are independent and they are sovereign. Or that this is an institution of the member state. The member state set it up and gave it, his, you know, gave it its powers, you know, to have as the principal legal organ of the community. And all it's doing is just to perform the functions that have been given to it under, under the treaty. But I will say that because of the decisions the court has given, the court has given, you know, some member states are not favorably disposed to the court. You know, they are doing a, to some a political backlash, maybe not as much as the SADC tribunal received that as uh, you know in 20, 2010, that finally killed the court in 2014. You know, not comparable to that, but an effort was made by the Gambia 2008-2009 to introduce, to amend the protocol of the court to introduce the, the requirement for resolution of local remedies. Knowing fully well that if that is done, the court court of justice, uh, you know, will be rendered uh, useless. It will almost die because the experience we had in 2001 to 2005 before this human rights mandate was given to the court, the court was an in inactive court. Only two cases we are lodged before the court, Olajide Afolabi and Frank Uko. And those two court cases we are brought by individuals who didn't have uh, direct access to the court as, you know, the court was principal and interstate court at that point in time. So that was a, a, major, a major challenge. So the court has actually capitalized uh, on the provisions of his law and the advantage the court had that it is not constrained. It is not constrained because what the court says is his practice is what his practice is. It's not spelled out in any document. It doesn't have a, it's not tied to one human rights instrument. It can go as far afield as possible. You know, it has a very wide discretion. So that effort failed. But again, last year, it was, you know, two other countries started to move again, the Côte d'Ivoire and Senegal. You know, they were not happy against the decisions of the court. One, they claim that, uh, that we are taking over the cases from national courts, which is not true. That instead of coming before their national court, their citizens are coming directly to the court, court of justice. They are not happy, you know, about that. Second, the, and they complain about the compensation that we are being awarded by the Equals Court of Justice. They were unduly too high. They took the complaint to the chairman of the authority of first of state and government, who was the president of Ghana last year. And the president of Ghana actually agreed with them that uh, there was a need for the protocol on the court to be amended, you know, in order to introduce the principle of exhaustion of local remedies. So that's still ongoing. Fortunately for us, it's no longer the chairman of the authority. And uh, we don't know how far, you know. And the Attorney General of Ghana actually quite spoke vehemently in support of introducing the social local remedy. But the point is, when they empower, you know, when they empower, you know, they want as much as possible to see if they can prevent their nationals from coming directly to the court. But the minute they lose, Equals Court of Justice, the first place they rush to. Now, these eight former heads of state or prime minister have come to the Equals Court of Justice. Once their rights are available, once they're in power, they don't remember. They want to, you know, you know, to arm twist the court if, if possible to make the court redundant. But if they leave, they don't go before their national court. If the Equals Court of Justice, they themselves rush to. So, okay. What was that? No. Okay, now, okay. Yeah. So actually, I have a question about the specific case of Hadija Tumani and some principles around it. I studied politics in this year, okay. and uh, I used to listen to BBC Africa every morning. I remember to this day, the day that a verdict was announced, yeah. and I came here to Tufts and I told my students, this was a great day, and I said, I want to meet Hadija Tumani. Yeah. I had a project in Niger studying Islam and female empowerment among Tijani at the Niger. And it ended up being um, a documentary, House of Language documentary. And I was thinking I wanted to have Hadija Tumani in the documentary in some way. So that even pushed me more to want to meet her. It took me three years because I was going to Niger every summer. The third year, through the local Nigerian NGO that I worked with her, they agreed to take me to where she was living. 
So she had been freed. She'd had her, her money, been to the White House and everything. In order to see her, I could not go. They told me I couldn't go there on my own. I couldn't just get in the car and go where she was living. They had to take me there. And I had to have an escort whom I had to pay as a, um, a consultant or something, a, a per diem. And she was living not too far from uh, one of the major cities in Niger, but on a ridge. And I had to stay at a little motel. I went out with their person. He got a per diem. I had to pay for his food, uh, the hotel room. And then we got there, their local representative pay, pointed up on a ridge. He said, she lives up there. So if you want to see her, there are only two ways you can see her. Somebody can put you on the back of a motorcycle and you can go up. There were no roads, there were rocks. You could go up there or we could try to contact her and bring her down. And I said, well, let's try contacting her first. And if she can't come down, then I'm gonna get on the back of this motorcycle. Uh, before I left, I said, okay, well, when I see her, uh, since I'm here, I've got you know this entourage is taking me, what do I give her? The person said, oh, we had some journalists from Belgium who came last week, they gave her a bar of soap. And I said, that's it? They said, yes. So you can decide what you want to give her. So I decided, I went and I bought three bars of beauty soap. And I asked the guy what was his per diem. And I said, she's gonna get a per diem for the day, how many she spends, no matter how many minutes she speaks to me. And she's gonna get these three bars of beauty soap. When she came down, I mean, she was dressed nicely because she had gotten some clothes to meet big people. And um, so I learned how to speak Hausa in Peace Corps. And I thought, I am going to talk to her directly. I'm not gonna have my escort do this. So first of all, I had to explain to her who I was and everything. And we're sitting there and I then asked her, um, so have you ever wanted to learn how to read? Because in talking to the various people who had helped her be, liber be liberated from slavery, the, I, the women I had been studying, they had local language, uh, literacy. I mean, there were lots of things that they were doing, had a big empowerment agenda. And they said, well, you know, we're trying to, uh, we actually set up a, a school for the children of the people we've liberated from slavery. We hadn't thought about adult education. And in fact, we're annoyed because the Niger government now won't take over paying for these schools. And I said, well, why didn't you let your children go to just regular school? Why did you create a school for the children of freed slaves? And so I was having these conversations that my sense of what this big legal apparatus, international, of liberating people from slavery, the question is what happens after us? There's this book, Slavery and Social Death. What slavery really is, is a form of social death. And just being liberated, if you aren't able to become uh, an active member of society, you really have not been liberated from slavery. So I, I then knew when I get to meet her, I have one question. And I wanted to ask her if she ever wanted to learn how to read. And she looked at me and she said, well, no. And I said, why not? She said, what would somebody like me do with reading? And then I said to her, I thought I wasn't prepared. And I said to her, have you ever heard of Mama Chota? Mama Chota is the woman I was making this movie about. And she has a women's movement. Uh, uh, and she had heard of Mama Chota. So then I told her, well, I'm making a movie about her. And she, in this movie, there are women who didn't have a chance to go to school, but they learned how to read and write in their local language. And they're actually running a, a credit association. They've been doing it for 18 years. And that's gonna be in the movie. So I said, when I get the movie done, I'm gonna come back and make sure you see it. So I finished the movie. I went back to Niger. I talked to her minders. And I said, I want to have a screening of this movie. And I want to, uh, 
I need to do my need to attend. Where is she? She's up there on that ridge. I said, okay, well, I'm gonna, I've got portable equipment. I'm gonna go out there. And I said, well, maybe if she's gonna see that there's some other women, they said, oh yeah, we have about 18 women up there. And they, we agreed that they would arrange for a screening of the movie for these women. I had to pay for a car to drive them from the ridge to come down to uh, Vinny and Connie where I screened the movie. And I saw Hadija Tumani three years afterwards. I was so upset by the way she looked that I, I would not allow myself to take her picture because I felt it would be like a violation of her humanity. But I did take pictures of the group. And initially, uh, and they were just brought down from the ridge and put in the, on the grounds of the Mary where I was gonna have the screening. They had their babies with them, they had no food, and the screening was gonna be that night. So I actually paid, I, I created per diem for every one of these women to be able to buy something to eat and do something until we had the, the meeting. She had another baby. So she had a baby when I met her. Uh, she had a baby, the baby had sores all over its body. Uh, she had lost so much weight and she clearly looked sick. We had the screening of the movie. Her baby kept crying, so she wasn't able to sit through the movie. But one of the things I do when I screen this movie, I pet, and publicly, public screenings, afterwards I pass a mic around. And there were three women for release, if for free from slavery, who had been up there on that ridge, took the mic and said, We, I want to learn how to read. I'm tired of being poor. I'm tired of being up there. So my question was, and this, the, what my question one is the court is doing wonderful things. Where, the, where is the sort of society that is connected with this? And then in terms of the particular case, while I was sitting waiting for them to bring Hadija Damani down, the man with the group who was sitting with me, he looked at me and he said, well, you have freed her, but there are three other women just like her in that same household she came from. When are you gonna do something about them? And I was shocked again. <laughs> and I subsequently learned that the, this was, to me, this was Brown versus Board of Education about desegregated schools, ending slavery and this sort of thing. And apparently the, the verdicts only apply to the individual, they're not. But I would, I would like to have that clarified. So, and that's a great note on which to then bring the conversation to a close. Um, so after these judgments, then what? That's the yeah, that's the you're so good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for that uh, question. The, is the state, the state of Asia, because in that particular case, the courts condemned the administrative and judicial authorities of Asia Report, you know, for not being able, you know, for the continuous violation of our right. And uh, beyond her, because it was the system that was already institutionalized. And all the court was asking this man to leave. It is illegal. It cannot so off. We cannot do that. So it was not meant to apply just to her. And uh, from the understanding we have is that the court, the Nigerian government implemented and the 10 million safe that was awarded in our favor. So our understanding was paid, you know, unless someone has to be given, but it was Ten million that was awarded. So it was it was it's against the system that Sarah, you are the body, you know, because it institutionalized slavery. And for for many years, the administrative and judicial authorities in uh, in the Niger could not handle it. Even in the case of uh, Hadija Jumani, you know, even when she was supposed to have been emancipated after having stayed in the final number of years and she ran away and married somebody yeah. because in Niger killed her husband, you know, and her because that she belonged to somebody, you know. So the administrative, so it was not just the, the, the administrative system, but the judicial authority were calling condemned by the court in the system. So all I would say that it was meant to erase that from the national system, national life of the Republic, and not just a to money, you know. 
Okay. So, um, unless there is a profound act of protest, <laughs> uh, we will try and bring this dialogue to a close. Who you, you, you really want to protest? I really want to protest. <laughs> I have one question. I have two, but I'll just do one. In a region that's so culturally, historically, and um, religiously diverse, uh, how do you all come up with a list of standards of human rights that everyone in those states can agree on? And when you do, in this case, like how are you able to enforce it with the state that might not agree with the original human right that has been violated? Does that make sense? Well, I don't know if I understand it very well. Let me attempt an answer. If I don't get into it, you let me know. <laughs> See, these human rights standards, the human rights standards, international human rights instruments that the court applies. As I mentioned from the beginning, ECOWAS does not have its own catalog of rights. And uh, the primary instrument is the African Charter on Human People's Rights. I equally said that the court has gone beyond that. The basic United Nations human rights instruments, it applies. And has also equally gone beyond that, that any treaty, any human rights treaty that a member state has uh, you know, signed the court to implement it against that member state. So it's a very wide scope. But if you look at this international human rights instrument, all of them might have similar provisions. So if you have one, you have, you know, you have seen them all because you have all of them. These, these are basic rights that are, are guaranteed by this instrument. Some are specialized. You look at CEDAW, as I mentioned, you look at the additional protocol to the African Charter on the Rights of Women, which I said the Court Court of Justice is the first court in Africa to an, Apply, apply. So the court has applied all these instruments, not because they are indigenous to ECOWAS. They are not made by ECOWAS, but ECOWAS states are signatories to those uh, treaties. And that's why the court, you know, applies them. The court will enforce or, you know, or apply any treaty, any human rights treaty that any ECOWAS member state has signed. Even despite the fact that ECOWAS uh, Court of Justice or ECOWAS was not party to it. Once as its sovereign states, you sign any human rights instrument, equals cut of just will implement that human rights instrument against you. So, thank you very much. Um, and the point about universality actually is, is very well made. As all of you can see, the weather is totally balmy today. Um, but the visit of a person from a very a part of the world where the weather is balmy. Uh, so that tells you that universality is something that is very well uh, part of the of the ethos of, of Boston. Um, <laughs> and on behalf of all of us here, uh, please join me in thanking Tony uh, for this conversation. My hope is that this is just the beginning. And we are, you know, and so the dialogue should please continue. And those who want to have dialogue in bilaterals are welcome to do so. Uh, so he will probably linger for a little while before transitioning to other places. And if you want to engage, him, feel free to do so. Uh, this is the first of our uh, High tables this semester. The second will be on the 15th of next month. Uh, sorry, second of next month. Yes. And we'll be looking at uh, global authoritarianism and how to uh, address that. A very little subject matter in which this country has now had uh, a wonderful experience. Uh, so uh, you're welcome to think about that. And uh, meanwhile, please join me. <laughs> this, this story is <laughs> yes i am doing a double difference <laughs>